Hi, I'm Chris Evinger, and welcome to Nightfall Audiobooks. Now that 99 Fear Street has concluded, I figured it was time for a springtime book. So I chose The Cheater by R.L. Stein. It is book 18 in his Fear Street series. It's very short. It's about 24 chapters, so it should be done within five or six weeks. I would like to keep to a seasonal schedule where I give you spring, summer, fall, Halloween, Christmas. So that would be another five books, roughly. I don't have those other books planned right now. I just have dates blocked out with notes saying summer book, part one through six, fall book, part one through six, Halloween, so on and so forth. This podcast will be R.L. Stein for the immediate future. I don't see it changing anytime soon. He's very easy to read, and he's one of my favorite authors. Him and Christopher Pike are my favorite authors. There's other authors that are great and stuff, but these guys are easy. They're easy to digest. I can get into characters with them easily enough. It's not overwhelming. It's not a huge production on my end. Recording it's pretty pretty easy, and just getting it done for you and recording you know, 20 to 30 minutes a week is pretty easy too. I may be changing the format of this podcast. I've been giving you roughly 20-25 minutes per week. I ended 99 Fear Street Book 3, The House of Evil, the third horror, with close to 40 minutes because it was really weird to cut that up. The way the chapters were written, I didn't want to stop mid-chapter, and I didn't want you to get like a 17-minute week and then like a 25-minute week. It was very strange. The third book is my second favorite in that trilogy. My first favorite is the first book, second favorite is the third, and my least favorite is the second. I don't really care for Brant's story. It's kind of a throwaway story. It's not really a 99 Fear Street story. It's sort of just there. If it wasn't a trilogy, I wouldn't have read it. Let's put it that way. Books I'm looking forward to doing are this one, The Cheater. I want to do One Evil Summer, but I just read that to my wife, and I don't think I want to read it again so soon. And I haven't figured out the voices for that book yet, so I'm going to put that on the back burner until next year. I do have next year sort of figured out in my head. I want to do Silent Night every Christmas until it's done. And there's three Silent Night books, so that's pretty cool. 2022 will be Silent Night 1, 2023 is Silent Night 2, and 2024 should be Silent Night 3. And that should be the end of my Christmas books for the foreseeable future from Arnold Stein. No, I haven't recorded them yet. I'm recording as I am going and getting it ready as I go. I like to queue all this stuff up on Anchor and YouTube and get all that stuff ready way, way, way in advance. Right now, I'm recording this on the 4th of February, and I'm getting ready for my May books. I love doing this. This is a lot of fun for me. I will give you another update before and after each book. So this is the Cheaters update. Once the Cheater is over, I'll give you another update. And then I'll update you again before the summer book starts. If you have any recommendations for the next book for summer or fall or Halloween or so on, I would love to hear from you guys. Please drop me an email at nightfallaudio at gmail.com or on Twitter at Nightfall Audio. And I will see you once the cheater is over. The Cheater is a really good spring book. It's about satisfying your parents' very high expectations on test scores and things. And Carter Phillips decides to cheat on her SAT test. And boy, does it backfire. I like this book because I was able to put myself in Carter's position very easily. It's short. It should only be six or seven weeks. And that'll take us right into summer. Welcome to Nightfall Audiobooks production of The Cheater by R.L. Stein. This is a Fear Street novel, book number 18. Chapter 1 The first time Carter Phillips thought about cheating, it was a joke. Carter had never cheated in her life. 
Later that day, she surprised herself by thinking about it seriously. Am I desperate enough to cheat, she wondered, and the frightening answer came back. Yes. As she sat in advanced math class, chin in hand, her silky white blonde hair hanging veil-like in front of her face, she stared at Mr. Robb, standing behind his desk. Why had she ever thought she could do advanced math? Just a reminder, said the math teacher. He was a pale, thin, bald man with a brown mustache. If any of you want to take the math achievement test again, it's being given Saturday at Waynesbridge Junior College. It's a chance to improve your score, but most of you guys did okay the first time, I'm happy to say. The bell rang. Carter sighed and picked up her books. She was joined by her boyfriend, Dan Mason, and her best friend, Jill Bancroft. The three of them made their way out of the classroom together. Jill flipped her long brown hair over her shoulder and turned to Carter with sympathy. Do you really have to take it again? she asked. I mean, your score was better than mine, and I'm not taking it on Saturday. You don't have to live with my father, Carter said with a sigh. Judge Carter, who judges all the time. Carter's father was a criminal court judge in Shadyside. She was very proud of him. She knew that people admired him, that he had a lot of influence in town. More than anything, Carter wanted to please her father, but it wasn't always easy. He had very high standards, and he expected Carter, his only child, to live up to them. Carter's father used to tell her how proud he was of her almost every day, but something had gone wrong. Carter was a very good student, but her weakest subject was math. She remembered the exact day, a few months earlier. Her math achievement test scores had just arrived in the mail. Judge Phillips stood watching over her shoulder as she opened the envelope. She looked at the score, 570. Not bad, she thought, pleased with herself. Not bad for math. She turned around to show the score to her father, but saw that he had already seen it. She could tell by his face that she'd been wrong. Evidently, 570 was not a good score. Frowning, the judge crossed his arms over his chest and said, Well, Carter, I guess I'll have to take it over again. You can't get into Princeton with a math score like that. He turned and strode back into his study, shutting the door behind him. Carter's heart sank. She'd always been able to please her father. She'd won tennis tournaments, school prizes, and made an honor roll every year, but now she couldn't. Her father had graduated from Princeton, and he talked about sending Carter there as long as she could remember. She'd never even asked herself whether she wanted to go to Princeton. It'd always been a given. Now it appeared that something stood in her way, advanced math. One little test score was keeping her from being successful, keeping her from fulfilling her father's dream. It didn't seem fair. Carter had tried her best, but this time her best wasn't good enough. Carter's mother came into the living room just after the judge had shut himself in his study. Carter was still standing with the test results in her hand, her head hanging down. Mrs. Phillips didn't even ask Carter about the test scores. She just glanced at the closed study door and said, Honey, I'm late for the hospital fun meeting. Tell your father I'll be home around six, will you? She kissed Carter on the forehead and breezed out the door with a clatter of jewelry. Carter stared after her in a daze. She realized she'd have to take the math test over. She'd have to study and study. There was no way out of it. Deep down, she knew it wouldn't help. She'd never get the score she needed. Not in a million years. Now Dan put his arm around Carter's shoulders as they walked through the hall at school. It won't be so bad, Carter, he said. Just a few hours on Saturday and it'll be over forever. Carter looked up at her tall, good-looking boyfriend and tried to smile. I don't mind her taking the test. Not too much anyway, she said. That's not the problem. The problem is that Daddy expects me to score at least 700, and I know I can't do that. I studied my brains out the first time I took the test. I've been studying hard this time, too, but it's hopeless. You have to be practically a genius to get a 700, and I'm no math genius. Dan sighed. Carter knew he felt uncomfortable about this. He was great at math and had scored 720 on the test, but he was a modest guy, and he didn't want Carter to feel bad about it. So he changed the subject. What you need is a milkshake. My treat. Let's go to the corner. He turned to Jill and asked, Want to come? Jill shook her head. I can't. I've got a photography club meeting. Try to cheer up, Carter. See you later. Bye, Jill. Now that Jill was gone, Carter let herself lean over and rest against Dan's shoulder. They stepped outside into a damp, breezy, warm spring day, unusually warm for March. They walked a few blocks to the corner, a coffee shop and hangout for kids from Shadyside High. It was busy. All the booths were taken. Dan and Carter had to settle for the counter and ordered chocolate milkshakes. Dan reached down the counter for a copy of Car Talk lying there. Some motorhead must have left it, he said, flipping the pages. 
He stopped at a photo spread of luxury cars and asked Carter, If you could have any of these cars, which would you pick? It was a game they often played. Carter and Dan would drive down a block in their fancy North Hills neighborhood and ask each other which house they'd pick if they could have any one they wanted. Or they'd flip through a magazine and ask each other which outfit they'd pick, or which models they liked the best, or what island they'd go to, if they could go anywhere. Carter wasn't really in the mood for the game, but she dutifully looked over the cars and pointed to a blue Jaguar. I think I'd pick the BMW, said Dan. Carter didn't look at the BMW. She was absentmindedly watching as the waiters and waitresses changed their shifts. Adam Messner, who was in their advanced math class, took an apron from a hook and tied it around his narrow waist. He was starting his shift behind the counter. Dan's hand covered hers and she turned back to him, to his handsome face, his jaunty smile, straight brown hair, and kind green eyes. Good old Dan. He'd always been there for her. He was acting concerned. Still worrying about your tests? he asked her. She nodded. Things are so tense at home, she told him. You know my dad. He always has a lot on his mind. But now with the Austin case and reporters hounding him, he comes home from court every day in a terrible mood. Everyone in Shadyside knew about the Austin case. Henry Austin was a notorious gang leader who'd been arrested for murder. The press couldn't get enough of the story, and Judge Phillips, who hated publicity, was presiding over the case. Mom's no help, Carter went on. Sometimes I think all her chatter about her charity balls and committee meetings makes Dad edgier. She lives in her own little world. It's as if she wants to ignore all the tension in the house, pretend it isn't there. Carter glanced up at Dan. He nodded and squeezed her hand, encouraging her to say more. And then I come along with my stupid math problem. Dan, there's no way I can get a 700 on this test. I took a practice test just last week, and I only scored 600. Daddy's going to go through the roof if I don't do better than that. She sighed and lowered her head, letting her hair fall over her face. If only I could borrow your brain on Saturday, just for one day. She stopped suddenly and raised her eyes to meet Dan's. She tucked her hair behind her ears. Hey, she said, half laughing. You could get a 700 again easily. Maybe you could take the test for me. I mean, Carter could be a boy's name. She let the sentence trail off when she saw Dan's expression. His smile faded. He frowned. Carter felt her face grew hot. She knew she was blushing. How could she have said such a thing? Hey, come on, Dan. I was just kidding, she said. She poked him in the ribs and pretended to be offended that he could have thought she was serious. His face relaxed a bit. Yeah, I, I knew you were kidding, he said nervously. Carter pretended to believe him. Dan slurped the rest of his milkshake and glanced at his watch. I've got to go. Mom wants me to pick her up at the tennis club. Want to ride home? No thanks, said Carter. I'm going to meet Jill at the mall in a little while. Dan stood up and kissed her on the cheek. Don't worry about the test. I know you'll come through. She smiled at him. Sure, she said. See you tomorrow. He kissed her again, turned, and made his way out of the restaurant. She watched him walk out the door. Staying a minute longer, she stared at the counter and sipped her milkshake. Dan was the greatest, sort of. He was so honest, so straight. She liked that about him, but it bothered her at the same time. Carter was good, too, basically. But sometimes she had an urge to do something just a little bad. Dan was always there to stop her, to keep her sensible and honest, to make her feel guilty for thinking about it, whatever it was. She pushed her glass away and glanced up. Adam Messner was smiling at her across the counter. How long had he been watching her? Carter shifted nervously under his gaze. That smile, there was something behind it. Had he heard her talking to Dan? Adam slowly leaned across the counter toward Carter, leading close. I'll do it, he whispered. She started to pull back from him. What do you mean? Do what? She knew what he meant. The test, he said. I'll take it for you. She studied his face, a lean, dark-eyed face under a longish black hair. He wasn't smiling now. He was serious. Adam was not a friend of Carter's. He lived in a shabby house on Fear Street, and he hung out with a rough crowd. But he was brilliant at math, Carter knew. I shouldn't do it, she thought. It wouldn't be right. But even as she thought this, she knew she wanted to. She thought of her father. How disappointed he'd be when he saw her new score. No better, maybe even worse than the first. No, she thought, I have to get a 700. I'll do it. I'll cheat. She nodded at Adam. She knew he understood. Why are you doing this for me? She whispered. The way I see it, he said, moving in close to her, his lips almost brushing her ear. I've got something you want, and you've got something I want. Chapter 2 what is it? Carter stammered. What do you want? Adam rested his head in his hands, elbows on the counter. You have to go out with me. One date. 
One date, Carter thought, that's all? She relaxed. All she had to do was go out on one date with Adam and her test problem would be over. Or would it? Could it really be that easy to cheat on the test? What if they ask for ID or something? Carter whispered. What if they find out what we're doing? They won't, Adam replied confidently. I took the test at Waynesbridge the last time. It's in this huge auditorium filled with hundreds of kids. Nobody checks IDs or anything. It'll be a piece of cake. He's got it all figured out, Carter thought. It really might work. Dan would be upset if he found out, but he won't find out. Carter was pretty, and she knew how to handle guys. She'd go out without him once, get rid of him, and not tell a soul about it. It was almost too easy. This thought made her pause. She studied Adam again. She'd never realized before that he was interested in her. She'd never even given him much thought. Now that she was looking at him, she couldn't help but think he was cute, in a dark, brooding way. He didn't have Dan's all-American good looks, but he had something Dan didn't have, an air of mystery, a sexy kind of daring. He was standing behind the counter now, meeting her gaze, slouching, cool as ever. All right, she said, one date. Now he smiled, just a little. Let's make it Saturday, the night of the test. I can't, Carter said. I have a date that night with Dan. Break it. She raised her eyebrows in surprise, but she knew she'd break her date with Dan, just this once. Another thought occurred to her. What is Sheila going to say about this? She asked Adam. Sheila Koss was Adam's girlfriend. Carter didn't know Sheila well, but she'd always felt a little afraid of her. She was tough and didn't mind getting into fights. Which Sheila doesn't know won't hurt her. Carter nodded. Well, I'd better get out of here. See you. She waited for Adam to reply. Instead, he picked up a rag and started wiping up. Carter woke up with a start on Saturday morning and looked to her clock, 8 a.m. She got dressed quickly. She had to pretend to be going to Waynesbridge. Her father was already shut up in his study when she went downstairs to grab a glass of juice. Mrs. Phillips was on her way out the door. "'What are you doing up so early?' she asked Carter. "'I'm taking the math achievement test today,' Carter said. "'Remember?' "'Oh, that's right. Well, good luck, dear. I'm off to the country club. The spring fling is almost here, and we've still got so much planning to do.' She threw her daughter a quick kiss and hurried out the door. Carter finished her juice and left. She got into her car and drove toward Waynesbridge. But she passed the Waynesbridge exit and continued on to the nearby state park instead. She parked under some leafless trees and sat in the car, waiting. Staring at the clock on the dashboard, nine. Adam would be starting to test soon. Carter felt her stomach knot up. I hope everything goes okay, she thought. I hope he really shows up and takes it. I hope no one catches him. I hope they don't ask him for ID. I hope no one recognizes him. I hope I don't get caught. Three hours later, she started the car up and drove home. Her mother was still out, and her father still locked up in his study. Carter checked the answer machine for messages. There had been no calls. She wanted to hear from Adam to know what had happened. She was sitting in the kitchen when her father came to get his lunch. He looked tired, but he smiled when he saw her. Carter, you're back. I didn't hear you come in. She felt her face grow warm. To hide her blushing, she went to the refrigerator and started digging through the shelves. Hi, Daddy. Can I fix you a sandwich? Judge Phillips sat down at the kitchen table. How did the test go? Great, said Carter. I really think I ace it this time. I'm glad to hear it. I knew you could do better. Carter's face reddened even more, but the judge didn't notice. She busied herself making him a ham sandwich. She was just dropping it on a plate when the phone rang. She nearly jumped. I'll get it, she cried, running to the phone. Hello? Hello, Melanie. Melanie was Carter's mother. This is her daughter, Carter said. She's out right now. May I take a message? She jotted down the message from the woman, who was one of her mother's friends. Then she hung up. Her father was nibbling the sandwich and reading the front page of the newspaper. The headline caught Carter's eye. Number two in Austin gang testifies against boss, admits to murders, bribery, fraud. That's daddy's case, Carter thought. I think I'll go upstairs and take a nap, Carter said. I'm pretty tired. Go ahead, honey, said her dad. You deserve it. She went upstairs and shut herself in her room. She had her own phone there. She dialed Adam's number. He answered. Adam, said Carter. Her heart was beating fast. It's Carter. How did it go? Beautiful, said Adam. It was a breeze. Carter breathed a sigh of relief. Then Adam added, until I tried to leave. Her heart froze. What happened? They asked everyone for photo ID. Sorry, Carter. They were ready for us. Carter squeezed her eyes shut. This is it, she thought. I've been caught cheating. My life is over. Chapter 3 Hey, Carter, said Adam. 
You still there? Carter struggled to catch her breath. Finally, she choked out. Yes, I'm here. The line went silent. Then Carter heard Adam making some kind of noise. It took her a moment to realize he was laughing. Laughing? What are you laughing at? She asked in a trembling voice. Did he really think this was funny? I was just teasing you, Carter, said Adam. No one asked me for ID. No one suspected a thing. The test went perfectly. We're in the clear. Carter struggled to choke back her anger. How could he joke about something so serious? Then she realized what was behind his joke. A message. This test was serious to her, but not to him. While he had nothing to lose, her whole future was at stake. Now, it's time to collect my payment. What time should I pick you up? Don't come here, Carter replied quickly. She didn't want anyone to see Adam pull up to her house, especially her parents. I mean, you don't have to pick me up. I'll meet you somewhere. All right. Where? Carter nibbled a fingernail as she thought about it. How about the corner of Village Road and Mission Street? This was in the old village several blocks from her house. Do you know where that is? Sure. I'll meet you there at eight. Good. And Carter, try not to dress like a North Hills princess. We're going into my world tonight, and it's no country club. He hung up before Carter could say a word. Carter was seething. How dare he call her a princess? She could handle any place he wanted to take her. Still, while dressing for the date later that evening, she was careful about what she wore. She put on a pair of ripped jeans and a plain black top. She took off all her jewelry. At five minutes to eight, she left the house, telling her mother that she was going to Jill's. She walked two blocks, then took the bus to Village and Mission, and waited. Five minutes later, a beat-up old black Mustang pulled up to the corner and stopped. It was Adam. He didn't turn off the motor and get out of the car. He just stuck his head out the window and gave Carter a sexy smile. Hi. Get in. She walked around the car to the passenger side. He flipped the door open as she slid in. They rode in silence. Awkward silence. Every few minutes, Carter glanced at Adam, trying not to let him see she was studying him. She couldn't help thinking that he looked great. He wore jeans and a plaid shirt, nothing special. But on his lean frame, they had an easy sexiness. In his same clothes, Dan would have looked neat and buttoned up somehow. But with his shaggy hair and dark eyes, Adam was almost a rock star. Carter watched as they rolled through the old village. Where are we going? she asked him. The underground. Ever been there? No, not yet. Carter didn't want to admit that she'd never even heard of it. They were slowly cruising through a seedy warehouse district. The streets were deserted, lit only by an occasional street lamp. They turned down a dark alley, and Carter noticed a lot of cars parked outside of the warehouse. There was no sign, just a red light over the door. Adam pulled into a small, clear area. Carter knew that this was it, the underground. Without a backward glance at Carter, Adam climbed out of the car and started toward the door with a red light over it. Carter followed him. Adam pulled open the door. Carter was suddenly hit by a blast of loud music. A brawny bouncer stood just inside. He glanced at Adam and checked Carter out, but he didn't stop them. The club was huge, dark, and crowded. Some people sat in a corner, smoking and talking. Others were crammed in the center of the room, dancing. Most of the guys had Adam's careless, slightly dangerous look. Uncombed long hair, scruffy clothes, combat boots. The girls wore jeans or tight dresses, dark lipstick, and sneering expressions. Carter knew she didn't fit in, no matter how hard she tried not to dress like a North Hills princess. Her jeans were torn at the knee but clean, her blonde hair neatly trimmed. Her skin had a pampered glow. She felt a little uneasy as she glanced around the club and saw hostile glares in the eyes of some of the girls. But knowing she was out of place comforted her too. At least, she thought, I won't run into anybody I know. As Adam had said, the underground was no country club. Adam took her hand and led her through the crowd into the dance floor. They started moving to the pounding beat. Adam was the first guy she'd ever danced with who didn't look stupid while he danced. He moved loosely with cool detachment. He danced in his own little world, but once in a while he gazed at her with burning eyes and gave her that smile. The music went on and on without stopping, one song moving seamlessly into another. Carter found herself getting lost in it. She forgot about the people all around her and just danced. She glanced up at Adam and found him staring at her while she moved. They locked eyes and danced together without touching. The room grew more crowded. People bumped into them, pushed them closer, but it was all part of the music and the beat. The club was getting hotter, the music even louder. Carter didn't know how long she danced. She felt a drop of sweat slide down her back. The crowd had thinned a little when Adam took her hand again and pulled her off the dance floor. He stopped at a table and asked for two glasses of water. Carter drank the water quickly. She was very thirsty. Her face and hair were now damp with sweat, 
She was having a good time. It surprised her. Let's go, Adam said. He put his glass on the table, pulled hers out of her hand, and set it down too. Then he led her to the door. Outside the air was cool. Carter smiled and said, It feels great out here. Adam unbuttoned his shirt and fanned it around his body to cool himself off. You're a good dancer. Carter blushed a little. So were you. She glanced around, looking for the black Mustang. A lot of cars were gone. It must be later than I realized, she thought. She slid into Adam's car, and he drove her through the quiet, late-night streets. Carter rolled down her window and let the spring breeze cool her face. The radio played softly. At last, they turned onto her street. She told Adam to let her off at the corner. Adam pulled over to the curb. Carter couldn't help but feel the night was over too soon. She turned to him to thank him, but she had just managed to open her mouth when he leaned over and kissed her, long and hard. At first she was surprised, but then she lost herself in it, just as she lost herself in the music at the underground. When it was over, Carter found herself gasping for breath. Finally, she said awkwardly, Thanks for everything, Adam. Thanks for, you know, the test, and the date, too. She opened her door and climbed out. As she closed the door behind her, he called through the open window. What are you doing tomorrow? She stopped. The next day was Sunday. Tomorrow? I'm playing tennis with Jill at one of the clubs, if it's warm enough. Great. I'll meet you there at one. He what? This stopped Carter cold. One date, she thought. We agreed on one date. But before she had a chance to object, Adam sped off down the street. She watched his taillights disappear around the corner. He was gone. She hurried down the dark street toward her house. How had she gotten herself into this? What would she do with a guy like Adam at the North Hills Country Club? He'd fit in there even less than she fit in at the underground. And how would she explain it to Jill? Jill didn't know about the test or the date. No one did. And no one would. That was the most important thing of all. Adam couldn't have been serious, Carter thought. He doesn't really want to go to the club. He was just teasing me. Another joke. Soon she convinced herself that Adam didn't mean to go to the club at all. She should have felt better, but the street was so eerily quiet, so empty and dark. She quickened her pace, glancing warily into the shadows all around her. The yellow light burned beside her front door, just a few more feet. She walked up to the front path. Don't worry, she told herself. You're almost home. You're almost safe. Then suddenly, something moved in the bushes next to the house. Carter froze. What was that? She stared at the bushes, but they were still. Then they stirred again. Carter was too frightened to run. A figure moved in the shadows. It's about time you got home, a voice said nastily. I've been waiting for you.